members of Moore's and Inform's Military Application Society hope will find what you will find uh, both informative and beneficial. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Eaton. I'm currently the uh, Advanced Analytics Offering Lead and Director of Operations Research Solutions with Concurrent Technologies Corporation. And I'm also a retired naval aviator uh, with uh, close to 4,000 hours in both uh, fixed wing and uh, rotary wing aircraft. I participate in both professional organizations and currently serve as an outlarge council member for uh, MASS. Um, quick ground rules uh, for, uh, for today is um, with regards to question and answers, uh, since we're on a tight timeline, uh, we, we request that you uh, ask any questions that come up during uh, today's presentation via the chat feature. Uh, type those in and then we'll make sure that we uh, get those answered uh, back to you. Okay, I'm having a slight glitch with uh, moving the slides. There we go. As you can see, a, a quick look at the agenda for uh, today's uh, shows that we're lined up several speakers that support both organizations, uh, each with the various backgrounds and experience. And uh, first, we'd like to talk to you about uh, why we decided uh, to do the, uh, the WebEx events, the proposed schedule that we'll be going through. Then we'll have Dr. Julie Seaton uh, provide us an overview of the Moors. Commander Walt DeGrange provide an overview of INFORM's uh, Military Application Society. Dr. Jim Morris will then provide an overview of uh, OR and the federal government and armed forces. And then we'll conclude with uh, Mr. Dan Berenger and an overview of uh, research areas. So why are we having these? Well, first of all, both organizations feel it's very important that, uh, and see that students are the future of our organizations. After uh, several discussions, we uh, kicked off a new joint uh, student membership program, which I believe you all are all part of, uh, and we kicked that off in May of this year. As a benefit uh, of, of that joint program, we're conducting these bi-monthly WebExes specifically for the students and driven by your interests and needs. As I said, the, uh, the WebEx will be held bi-monthly and we'll announce the uh, dates and times when they become finalized via the same uh, network that uh, introduced you to this program. The tentative schedule will be in the months of September, November, January, March, May, and July. Since the topics will be uh, student-centric, uh, uh, we definitely solicit your input. And uh, some of the uh, concepts that we've discussed here as we were planning these uh, and are not limited to, uh, student presentations on their on, on OR pro problems, what to expect in the first years as an OR analyst, and or how to get an internship uh, or job in the OR field. With that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Julie Seaton and uh, have her provide an overview of the operations uh, of Moore's uh, Society. Julie? Thanks, Jeff, and I'm really excited about this collaboration between Moors and Mass, and I'm honored to be allowed to talk about the Moors opportunities for students and young analysts. Um, and I'd like to do that through illustrating these opportunities through my own experiences as a Moors member. So, my association with Moors began in 2002 at the 70th Moors Annual Symposium in Leavenworth, Kansas. I presented the work being done at the Trade Doc Analysis Center at White Sands Missile Range in two different working groups, the Modeling and Simulation Working Group and the Operations Other Than War Working Group. The Emergency Response Exercise Program that I was managing at that time spanned several Moore's working topics, and the Moore's Working Group focuses shifted. Uh, and as those shifts happened, I supported the creation of the Working Group focused on Homeland Security, Homeland Defense, and Civil Support, Working Group 5. I became a co-chair, and then I moved into a chair position, and now I serve as one of the advisors. Uh, we currently have a new focus that's sprouting uh, in a related area, uh, and that area is interagency cooperation and collaboration, and we're looking for volunteers to serve as co-chairs and leadership in that respect. Next slide, please. 
So that sort of illustrates what some of the opportunities that we have in terms of volunteerism. And those opportunities abound if you have a little bit of time and some willingness to help. When I first started out with Morris, I didn't really understand the field of operations research. And so I asked, uh, particularly asked those who claimed the title of analyst. And I was told that being an OI analyst wasn't necessarily something that one set out to be, but rather it was a title earned through experience. You know, I knew that there were OR practitioners that could be cultivated from industrial and computer engineering programs and from serving in the military. So these were all pieces that I pulled together to understand how operations research worked. So over the years, Morris has expanded, and our leadership has proven to be flexible and willing to change to the environment. Morris has moved from a strictly military-focused organization to one that is firmly entrenched in operations research to support national security concerns that have both national and international ramifications. In addition to the annual symposium, each year Moores provides up to five special meetings that are designed to do deep dives into very specific topics that are of interest to our sponsors and to our membership. You can see some of those uh, listed here uh, coming up in October and November. You can see there are also some ongoing activities with various initiatives uh, to include community to practice, symposium workers groups, and focused membership initiatives, uh, such as this student bundling initiative with our professional community partner, the Military Application Society of Informed. Next slide, please. So over the past several years, Moores and Mass has cultivated a vibrant relationship, uh, culminating in this membership bundling initiative. And our goal is threefold. One, to increase visibility for operations research techniques and applications. Two, to increase membership for both organizations. And three, to engage in opportunities for new, useful, and innovative thinking. Our hope is that this student-centric opportunity will strengthen the professional ties between our organizations and increase the flow of new and talented and eager analysts into the national security arena. Next slide. So Moore's offers a really broad range of opportunities for students to fit into four general categories, educational professional development, mentoring, networking, and volunteerism. And I'll talk specifically about some of these activities. Next slide. Educational opportunities. Wow. Moore's is all over education. And these opportunities occur at every Moore's event. Tutorials open ev almost every single special meeting. And we have a full day of several, uh, up, to, up to 40 tutorials here in the symposium. Uh, many of these tutorials are being prepared right now to become available to, for member access on the Moore's website. Now, Moore's also has, an, has provided opportunities to listen to nationally and internationally recognized professionals who use OR methods or who have results that come out of OR activities. Uh, and just very recently, uh, General Robert Sheldon, the commander of NORTHCOM and NORAG, was our keynote speaker for the symposium. Dr. Peter Perla was the keynote speaker for the Educational Colloquium in April. And Mr. Robert Kelly, who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, came and spoke to us at the Countering Transnational Threats meeting that was held in December 2011. Next slide. So let me talk just a little bit about the Moore's Education and Professional Development Colloquium. Um, in 2012, this particular activity was held at the military, at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and there were two very intense academic discussions about software tools and the skill sets needed to prepare students for careers in operations research. This annual colloquium is a more sponsored event with student-centric competitions that require quick-turn analysis and problem solving, as well as provides opportunities to hone oral and written communication skills and meet other analysts. Next slide. Our mentoring activities um, are produced and monitored by our mentoring program. And this program 
brings together seasoned and inexperienced analysts so that they can learn from each other. And it's, it's always quite interesting to know that the, the mentors um, always say, you know, we learn as much or more than the mentees in this, res in, in this relationship. So the results of, mentor of the mentoring program includes job creation, job migration, job security, lifelong friendships, and really strong extended analytic family. And if you're interested in this mentoring activity, please get in touch with the Morris, with, with Morris through the website or give them a call. Next slide. And that brings us to networking and volunteerism. And the particular activity that would be of interest to you as students is the Young Analyst Initiative. And this is a, a relatively new activity that we've begun. Um, and it's where the young analysts create their own network of anal analytical support that are all young people who are just coming into the career field. And they develop events, and they work with the board staff and volunteers as helpers for each of the workshops and the, and the symposium. So um, if you're interested, get involved and bring a friend. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the Moore's Student Prizes and Awards. Next slide, please. And we have several that students are available are uh, eligible to receive. Uh, the David Wist Award is, uh, honors the best paper for the year. Uh, the Barty Prize honors the best presentation at a Moore's Symposium. The Wayne Hughes Award honors the best junior analyst. And junior analysts are considered under 40 years old and with less than 10 years of experience. The John K. Walker Award honors the best paper published in Phalanx, which is the Quarterly Bulletin of Operations Research. And then we have two graduate student awards, one that's given at the Naval Postgraduate School, known as the Tisdale Award, and a newly named award that, have, that occurs at the Air Force Institute of Technology. Uh, we've just named that one after Dr. James T. Moore. So, there are lots of opportunities to get recognition for your operations research work. And some of these prize-winning papers are posted on the Moore's website for viewing and, and consideration. So next slide, please. These opportunities complement the benefits that are offered by MAP. And now I'd like to turn this presentation over to Commander Walter Grange, who will talk about those opportunities and uh, Walt. Uh, one, uh, first, I would say thank you very much for letting me participate in this. Well, thanks. Hi, I'm Commander Walter Grange, and much like Julia, we've been working together over the past few years. Uh, my role, uh, my professional role currently is that I'm a military instructor at the Naval Post Graduate School, but I've been involved in um, the Military Application Society since 2006, and I'm currently the, uh, the Secretary Treasurer for the organization. And like Julia mentioned, we've been working this joint student membership for the past few years, and I'm very excited that we have the opportunity today to present uh, the joint student membership and the, uh, the actual webinars that I think will really provide a lot of value to uh, students uh, now and in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So INFORMS, MASS is a society within INFORMS. INFORMS is the premier operations research professional society uh, in the world, over 10,000 members. And uh, the conferences are, are very well attended and very large. It's the largest conference every year uh, that provides a great networking opportunity for students. It is the annual conference. Uh, last year it was in Charlotte, North Carolina. This year it's in Phoenix, Arizona. It provides a great opportunity to present your work. And more importantly, there are uh, job fairs there for both uh, in the private sector and in academia and in uh, government are all represented, well represented at these job fairs. Uh, the INFORMS also has another meeting uh, or another uh, conference each year, the Business uh, Analytics Conference, which is a little smaller. And the work that's presented there is uh, typically how OR is 
used in uh, to solve problems in uh, different uh, commercial and government applications. So that uh, is a great conference to go and learn uh, how OR is being used um, in, out in the real world. There are also regional conferences all around the country that may be closer uh, to where you're at and many of the uh, student uh, membership um, at, at the universities are well represented at these regional conferences and that's also a great place to um, meet other folks and to present your own work. So uh, the main point on this one is INFORMS has a strong student uh, presence and, and, and has organizations on many of the campuses uh, around the, the the country. Uh, next slide, please. NAS also sponsors awards. We have two in particular that uh, students um, win regularly. The uh, Koopman Prize is the best published uh, paper that uh, is related to military operations, and that has a $500 cash award. And we also have uh, the Bonder Scholarship which has a $4,000 grant and also provides $1,000 for travel for two conferences to present your work, which is a, a very nice uh, prize indeed. So uh, those are, like I had mentioned before, definitely open um, for students. And you know, like I said, many students uh, win these prizes uh, every year. Uh, next slide, please. With the joint membership, you also have the opportunity. Uh, there are two joint publications. One is the, the MORE Journal, the Military Operations Research Journal. This is a peer-reviewed journal and, and, and an excellent place to get your uh, work published. Uh, that is a requirement for many of your programs. So uh, this this journal you know, obviously is, is uh, more um, geared towards the military operations um, subjects, um, but yeah, it's been a very good uh, place to, um, to publish. And Phalanx, the Phalanx magazine, you, everybody, all the student, joint student members will receive a free online access to this magazine. And this is, uh, has current um, topics um, and it's relevant to the OR career field and uh, things that um, may not be at the level of a paper, but uh, relevant nonetheless to either techniques or uh, just you know, what is going on in, uh, in the field in general, and perhaps more relevant things. So uh, with that, um, uh, next slide, please. I will go ahead and turn this over to Jim Morris, who is, oh, by the way, the, uh, the winner of the 2011 Bonder Scholarship. Thank you, Walt. Uh, like Walt said, my name is Jim Morris, and I'm going to be providing a brief overview of operations research in the federal government, primarily focusing on the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. But let me emphasize that word brief, because hopefully you will see throughout this, uh, this part of the briefing how extensive OR is in the federal government. Next slide, please. Um, my experience, just to give you a quick background of, uh, one of just been the Department of Defense has made substantial investments in me to develop my OR skills. Um, I've been fortunate to receive long-term full-time training as well as a DOD SMART scholarship. So combined out of my short 11-year career, the government has invested almost two and a half years for me to be a full-time student working towards my PhD in operations research. Uh, this is just one reflection of the value that federal government places on operations research and hopefully you'll see that uh, throughout the federal government, they place a lot of value on OR. Next slide, please. Uh, a key thing before we begin is the organizational culture of the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security is one of mission first and service to the country. Uh, the problems faced by the federal government differ from private industries, say, well, of maximization of profit uh, or those types of problems. But the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security problems revolve around saving lives, protecting resources, as well as ensuring national security. Next slide, please. First thing about the federal government, it loves acronyms. 
These are some of the acronyms and terms that will appear in this briefing. DOD is the Department of Defense, which includes the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. DHS is the Department of Homeland Security, which includes a variety of government agencies, but is included in this overview briefing, namely for the Coast Guard. Other terms that are included in this briefing are military, which means the men and women who wear the uniform, and then civilians can reflect all other individuals. As you will see, the federal government utilizes both military and civilian members to perform OR to address its problems. Next slide, please. Operations research traces its roots back to World War II, and by some accounts even before, but the common thread is, in its origination is solving military problems. With this long history, I'm happy to report that OR is still highly valued by the federal government. Admiral Mike Mullen, the previous chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is the top military officer in the Armed Forces, has a master's degree in OR from the Naval Postgraduate School. On the slide, there's a link to a podcast of an interview conducted by the Institute for Operations Research and Management Science that describes Admiral Mullen's views on how OR positively impacted his career. Next slide. One of the greatest attractions of, of operations research in DOD and the federal government is the unique problems that are presented, as you can see on this slide. The other challenging aspect is the sh sheer scale of the problems. Take cost analysis, for example. Similar problems exist in the private sector, Though for government or DOD problems, we might be talking about billions of dollars or projects that span decades. Next slide. OR problems in DHS reflect the law enforcement nature of the organization. As can be seen by reviewing the list, a number of different techniques are applied against this problem set, from game theory to forecasting. The complexity and uniqueness of the problems faced by the federal government provide the opportunity for OR analysts to innovate solutions that extend the field of operations research. Next slide. Now for how DOD and DHS tackle some of these problems. Each of the services military members, again, individuals who wear the uniform, whose career is centered around operations research. Some of the services have individuals whose whole career involves them rotating from one OR job to another. Others have individuals who throughout their career have assignments that utilize their OR knowledge and skills. Next slide. How does DOD and DHS obtain people with the desired OR skill set? Um, as you can see on the slide, the DOD has a substantial investment in producing military and in some cases civilians with OR expertise. Each of the military academies has an operations research major as an option, producing young officers with a bachelor's in operations research. To develop advanced skills, DOD has two graduate schools, the Naval Postgraduate School and the Air Force Institute of Technology that enable military members and civilians to obtain masters and PhDs in operations research. DOD assigns military personnel as full-time students for one and a half to two years to get a master's and three years to get a PhD, which shows the level of investment DOD is willing to make to acquire OR professionals. As an alternative to obtaining a graduate degree, the Army also has a three-month course teaching OR techniques. Next slide. Complementing the military members practicing OR, each service and multiple agencies in the federal government employs civilian operations research analysts. These OR analysts can be civil servants or private company contractors, but regardless, it is usually a team of military, civil servant, and contractors tackling the complex problems faced by the federal government, DOD and DHS. Another advantage of working on OR problems for the federal government is where it can take you. Federal government and DOD OR civilian jobs are literally all over the world. I can't even provide a complete listing as it is quite dynamic where OR analysts are serving. Uh, there's even deployment opportunities to go into combat zones and practice OR. To get a sample of where jobs are located, I have listed the USA Jobs website, which is the job posting site for the federal government. Under occupational series, you can select operations research and see for yourself how OR jobs are all over the country and the world for the federal government. Next slide. To give you just a sampling of job locations in the United States, I've included a listing of major OR centers uh, within the DOD and Coast Guard. This list is by no means inclusive, but merely highlights some centers where there are large collections of OR analysts working together. Reviewing the listing, you can see the wide range of, uh, wide range of locations available to OR analysts serving the country. There are also numerous analysts working by themselves or in small groups who are supporting a variety of organizations and units by assisting them solving the problems they face in day-to-day -day operations. Again, this listing is by no means inclusive of locations, particularly because the federal government actively engages the research community, which Dan will discuss next. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and hello to all the students who have joined us today. My name is Dan Beringer, 
and I work at the Penn State University as a research engineer. And it's my privilege to provide the student members of Moores and Maps with an overview of military operations research. Next slide, please. As Dr. Morris mentioned, the origins of the activity called operations research are generally attributed to the beginning of World War II. Prior to that time, scientific approaches to managing organizations had been studied, but it was during World War II where the term operations research was coined. During that time, military management enlisted the help of scientists in the study of military operations in areas such as employing new radar technologies in anti-aircraft defense, determining the, the most defensible size of shipping convoys, and anti-submarine operations. The use of operations research in World War II is generally credited with playing a major role in winning strategic battles and campaigns. The success of OR during the war caused the study of operations research to extend well beyond the military, but the study of military operations continued as well. Today, the study of OR has come to encompass a very large spectrum of scientific approaches and application of technologies, and the boundaries of what is considered OR and what is not are often gray and fuzzy even to the leaders of the field. The emergence of the fields of business analytics, business intelligence, and their relationship to operations research has created even more discussion. INFORMS even dedicated a significant amount of time and effort to studying what its members thought were the similarities, differences, and relationship between OR and analytics. The relationship between the two was deemed significant enough to rename the Applied INFORMS Conference as the INFORMS Conference on Business Analytics and Operations Research. While the exact relationship between analytics and OR remains unclear, what is clear is that they, they are both applicable to enabling the warfighter to perform more effectively and efficiently. Common OR techniques applied to a wide breadth of military problems include linear and nonlinear programming, network analysis, game theory, forecasting, and simulation. Analytics is generally broken into three different types, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, each of which serves a different role in providing information and insight to the warfighter and supporting establishment. Descriptive analytics uses data modeling, trend reporting, and regression analysis to help turn data into information describing what the historical data means. Predictive analytics applies to more rigorous mathematical techniques, generally referred to as machine learning, data mining, or predictive modeling, to enable the prediction of future events based on historical data. And finally, prescriptive analytics uses optimization and simulation techniques to try to find the best and most robust solution to specific problems or predicted situations. Next slide, please. There are a couple of problems that have become particular areas of emphasis over the past few years within OR and analytics. One of the previous presenters referred to Admiral Mike Mullen, who is a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and who himself received a master's degree in OR from the Naval Postgraduate School. During the same interview referenced before, Admiral Mullen characterized these two problems the following way. He said, so how do I optimize flowing the right information to a decision maker? It varies. If you're a captain in the trenches out there in a village in Afghanistan, the information you need is obviously significantly different from the information I need. How do I have systems which support that, that pour through this glut of information that's out there to get the president and that captain in the trenches the right information at the right time? I would call it knowledge, not information. The first problem that Admiral Mullen referred to has become widely known in the commercial world as big data. It refers to the enormous amount of data that's being generated on a daily basis and the technical challenges associated with turning that data into meaningful information. New technologies and scientific methods for helping solve this problem is a very large area of research. For the purpose of this discussion, I'll refer to the second problem that Admiral Mullen mentioned as knowledge delivery. The challenge of knowledge delivery is that not everyone needs the same information. Admiral Mullen referred to the differences in the information that the president needs compared to the information that the captain in the trenches needs. There are an enormous number of different roles that warfighters play, and systems need to be developed to enable all of these decision makers to receive the information they need when they need it. Turning big data into information is of no use if the decision maker doesn't receive the information they need when they need it. When they do, it's called knowledge. Operations research has a key role to play in helping solve both of these problems, applying techniques such as mathematical programming, 
and network analysis, along with new information technology approaches such as semantic modeling and scalable data processing architectures. Next slide, please. Now we'll move on from some specific examples of areas of research to understanding the way the military assesses the maturity of new and evolving technologies. Technology readiness levels, or TRLs, are a critical part of understanding how technologies, including new OR developments, are matured for use by the military. This slide provides a brief description of the nine different TRLs. As technologies are developed, they progress from TRL1, where the technology is effectively a concept in a professor's brain, all the way to TRL9, where the concept is embodied in an applied technology product that is available from a commercial DOD vendor off the shelf. At TRL9, the technology has been successfully tested in operational mission conditions, meaning there is no additional R&D or research and development needed to deliver the technology into warfighters' hands. In between TRL1 and TRL9, technologies are matured, moving from theoretical ideas through applied research and development and progressing through increasingly difficult test environments, beginning with component testing in a laboratory all the way to integrated system testing in an operationally relevant environment. Many different R&D sponsor and performer organizations focus on different stages of this process, and I will discuss some of these different organizations next. Next slide, please. The United States Department of Defense has a very formal process for defining requirements for the acquisition of new systems called the Joint Capabilities Integration and Development Systems, otherwise known as JSIDs. JSIDs produces a variety of work products that document the need for new systems or processes to fulfill warfighters' needs. These requirements documents, along with vision documents produced by each of the military branches that outline where each of the services are headed in the next 10 to 25 years, and the threats that they need to address, identify critical areas on which R&D organizations need to focus their activities. There are many different organizations that sponsor all different types of research, and almost all of those organizations have projects that involve some form of OR. To begin with, every branch of the military has multiple organizations that perform R&D activities that focus directly on their own services needs. A good example of one of these organizations is the Office of Naval Research. According to their website, ONR coordinates, executes, and promotes the science and technology programs of the United States Navy and Marine Corps. Rather than focusing on specific branches of the military, other organizations perform R&D in support of all branches of the U.S. military. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, is a great example of this type of organization. DARPA's mission is to maintain the technological superiority of the U.S. military and prevent technological surprise from harming our national security by sponsoring revolutionary, high-payoff research, bridging the gap between fundamental discoveries and their military use. In this sense, DARPA is focused on research that is at lower levels of the TRL scale. A good example of a DARPA-sponsored OR project is called Detection and Computation Analysis of Psychological Signals. This program aims to develop novel analytical tools to assess psychological status of warfighters in the hopes of improving psychological health awareness and enabling them to seek timely help by developing tools to analyze patterns in everyday behaviors to detect subtle changes associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and suicidal ideation. An example of one final type of organization that sponsors OR-related research is the National Science Foundation. NSF is focused on basic or fundamental research, meaning the vast majority of projects sponsored by NSF focus on the bottom TRLs one to three described earlier. Some recently funded NSF projects relevant to military applications include projects in areas such as optimization, math programming, stochastic modeling, and supply chain. There was an excellent article about OR-related NSF projects in the April 2012 edition of ORMS Today that I'd encourage anyone interested in more information to read. Next slide, please. The final aspect of OR-related research that I'd like to cover today is the community of researchers that perform military-related operations research, R&D. This is not by any means intended to be a comprehensive list, but it does cover the vast majority of organizations performing this work. The first category to be mentioned is government research laboratories. 
There are numerous government research labs that conduct OR-related research, and this category was previously covered in depth by Dr. Jim Morris on the slide titled Major OR Centers. Moving slightly into the commercial and academic realm, other types of organizations that perform R&D are called FFRDCs, which stands for Federally Funded Research and Development Centers. FFRDCs are unique nonprofit entities sponsored and funded by the U.S. government to meet some special long-term R&D need, which cannot be met as effectively by existing in-house or contractor resources. University-affiliated research centers, otherwise known as UARCs, are similar to FFRDCs, but are specifically associated with universities. UARCs were established beginning in 1996 to ensure that essential engineering and technology capabilities of particular importance to the DOD are maintained. FFRDCs and UARCs are similar in that they are both nonprofit organizations that function in trusted advisor roles to their specific sponsoring agencies, but they are different in that FFRDCs receive a set amount of funding each year according to their contracts from their sponsoring agencies and cannot compete for federal contracts against non-FFRDCs, while UARCs do not receive a set amount of funding each year but can receive sole source funding and compete for S&T work unless specifically precluded from doing so in their, in their contracts. Commercial entities, often referred to as defense contractors, perform a large amount of R&D for sponsoring agencies. A few examples of the largest defense contractors include Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, and Boeing. Most of the largest defense contractors also invest in internal research and development, or IRAD. IRAD projects are funded with company profits to invest in innovative technologies that are likely to serve as foundational underpinnings of future products. However, commercial R&D in support of the military isn't limited to just large businesses. The U.S. government has set up a number of mechanisms to encourage small and minority or women-owned businesses to engage in R&D efforts such as the Small Business Innovative Research Program, or SBIR, and the Small Business Technology Transfer, STTR program. Over half the awards in the SBR program are to firms with fewer than 25 people, and a third are to firms with fewer than 10. STTR programs are similar in structure to SBIR programs and fund cooperative research and development projects with small businesses in partnership with not-for-profit not research institutions such as universities. And then, of course, there is academia, the community of students and scholars at universities and colleges engaged in higher education and research across the nation. All of these different types of organizations are engaged in a multitude of different research, including operations research. Depending on the type of research and the sponsor, these organizations fre frequently work together in mutually beneficial ways to produce an end product that winds up in the warfighter's hands. For example, a new analytical algorithm might start in an STTR program as a joint research endeavor between a small business and a university, beginning at TRL 1 to 3. If the new algorithm proved promising, it could then be transitioned into a larger program sponsored by a branch's S&T organization and in partnership with larger defense contractors who integrate the new algorithm into an IP system of systems. The new algorithm would be evaluated within the system of systems in progressively difficult operational conditions. Once the algorithm's abilities to handle various operational challenges have been proven within the overall system of systems, it would transition somewhere between TRL 5 to 7 to a military command responsible for the acquisition and sustainment of systems. This particular command would oversee the operational testing, deployment, and lifecycle support of the new system ensuring its effectiveness in accomplishing the warfighter's needs. This is just one example of how a new OR technology might be developed. And that concludes my portion of the brief and today's seminar introducing student members of Moores and Mass to the new joint membership program. I'd like to encourage each of the students listening to today's webinar to consider the information that you've heard today and consider where you envision yourself in the future. If you're interested in military OR, what will your focus be? Will it be fundamental research at a university sponsored by an organization like DARPA or NSF? Will it be applied research sponsored by a DOD service lab? Or will it be in industrial applications? Now that you know more about the possibilities, you can compare them to your interests and then tailor a plan for your education, research, and careers. On behalf of the Moore's Mass Committee, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today 
and we look forward to seeing you at our continuing webinars in the future.